As I said, it is the last panel of the Minsk Forum, uh, which took place not only today, but in different places in different days uh, for three days. But um, at first I was asked that it should be uh, to finalize um, the whole three days. But I think uh, this is not possible. Uh, to do so on the one hand because uh, there were different people taking part in different parts of the um, Minsk Forum and the different days uh, and even we uh, together are not took part all these days. Um, and so I uh, would like to start again, I would say, to have a general approach um, to that whole issue of the situation um, of today um, and um, to take that last hour uh, to ask ourselves um, on the one hand lessons learned looking back that it is, and it's a title 30 years of independence um, is there a future of independence and what is the role of Russia in it? What are the aims of Russia in the current situation? And uh, what is our view? And But at first, it's a question what the people in Belarus wish to do and are there strategies to reach it. Um, we will not be able to answer all these questions, uh, but I think it would be good um, to ask ourselves for the perspectives uh, of that independency. And independency is a part of self-determines. And these questions of independence and self-determines, in my view, should be in the center um, of it. Um, I can tell you, Sergei, um, at first that we had in the last panel, uh, there was a presentation uh, of a paper with uh, four scenarios. Uh, for Belarus and Katerina uh, was part of the group uh, um, working it uh, out and uh, Mr. Kegebein in the moderated uh, f f panel before of that uh, in the morning about the economic uh, situation which is not so bad um, and the questions of um, <clears throat> sanctions and the economic situation will play an important role uh, even in the question of independence. Uh, so I at first uh, I would like to ask you Sergei as a newcomer in the <laughs> conference at all and uh, without me I am a newcomer too I uh, only took part today and on the this morning online and now here being present. Um, but um, you are a part of the coalition talks now. Um, you are a part of the European Parliament, which uh, took this situation during the last one and a half years very serious. and took initiatives and made clear positions. Uh, and that's why I would like to ask you, what do you think um, is a point of the most danger of today? And what gives you hope? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And, and thanks to you know everyone here, because you keep fighting and you keep organizing things with this this great meeting great great format and uh this is actually what gives me hope uh that 
the people, uh, the people who keep fighting and, and who keep hoping. Um, and, and if anything, this, um, these years, uh, these months showed us that aspiration of democracy and democratic and European trajectory for Belarus are there and, and they are not linked to any government, they are linked to the people and to the voters. Um, the most risky um, situation, what is, what is the biggest challenge that we're, we're facing now, um, uh, is the, probably the inability of the European Union and of many neighboring countries to deal with Belarus in conjunction with Russia. I think that if Belarus was, um, you know, were a just a state and a government on its own without any um, mutual obligations vis-à-vis -vis Russia, if 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 Moscow and the Kremlin wouldn't be uh, standing behind it and playing the game, which is very ambivalent, uh, uh, with with Belarus, the situation would have been different. We would have many more options. Uh, uh, to act and to deal with the with with the regime, uh, but because of the this link, and because uh, the, the, it becomes a, a, a larger geostrategical game, uh, also for uh, Putin, and that makes it very difficult and very risky, uh, and we're seeing it now on the border uh, uh, to Belarus. So the options that we have are very limited, and I think that they they are. Um, uh, basically summed up in one word. I think this is the word sanctions. I don't, I do believe that we should be working on um, um, projects like trying to bring Lukashenko to justice. I think this is an interesting idea. This is a good idea. I do think that we should be working on something like an archive of all the of all the crimes uh, that's that's been committed in order to preserve the facts for the future. But if we're honest, this is not what's going to work. These are not the leverages of of geopolitical nature. What works is uh, pressure, and this pressure, the only pressure that I can imagine for now are sanctions, making them uh, uh, more uh, severe, uh, uh, closing loopholes, uh, especially considering um, uh, certain kalium and, and, and other imports and exports. And also looking at the financial situation, I mean, you, you probably talked about this or you can tell more, but um, you know, I don't think that this is the right way of giving and, and, and giving credits to and, and loans uh, uh, to the country by International Monetary Fund. This sounds not very friendly and cooperative, but the situation is like this. Uh, there is not much cooperation signaled uh, from the Minsk side. And frankly, the time for uh, some cooperative solutions is long overdue. Uh, is, is long over. Uh, so these are the two. The what is positive? Of course, the people. I don't think that anyone would say anything else. Uh, the citizens of Belarus. What is the risk and the negative? Uh, is of course uh, this this link between Minsk and Moscow. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that exactly this point is a danger of independency. Um, and we know in the um, history during the many years that the Union Treaty uh, between Russia and Belarus uh, is always an issue. And always um, Lukashenko is going on with it and at first very fast thinking he can be on the top. Uh, but I think he lost th this hope, I think. And uh, But even uh, even last year, or in the beginning of last year, he tried to go forward in this. But on the other hand, he was skeptical. And in the end, he insisted in that independency. Now he is in such a way dependent from Russia. Um, that is the question, what will Putin do um, to uh, link it, both countries, more and more, financially, economically, um, buying enterprises, um, dominating the financial system, 
That's why at first, the economic, you are the expert uh, for that. What do you think can happen or is there a danger? Uh, even because the Belarusian economy, as you said in your panel before, it is not so bad. It is not so much um, brought down by the sanction because it needs time. On the other hand is the question what perspective it has. Uh, so, lots of topics. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe first, um, oh, um, the, this link to Russia and uh, the question of dependency or, in, or being independent from Russia. Mm -hmm. if, if you look that you have certain structural dependencies from the Union State, so there is a, n no independence when it comes to this structural treaty-based um, kind of integration. Second, um, when we look on the, on the trade figures, import-export, Russia is in import-export more or less the half, stands for more or less a half of the Belarusian import export. Germany, I guess, for the exports is number seven with 3% share. Mm -hmm. So if you compare, you see where dependence is or in, no independence is. And, and, and thirdly, in the previous years, uh, the figures dif uh, differs a bit more roughly uh, subsidiaries of more or less 100 billion dollars were, were paid in terms of reduced fees for oil and gas. So these three facts shows the strategic dependence uh, of, of very of, of the Belarusian uh, economy uh, to Russia. So that means there the question is already more or less answered that we see a very high level of, of dependency. Uh, to Russia. Um, of course, Lukashenko in the last years tried to uh, be political independent, but if you really look to the figures and to the treaties and to the numbers, you see already a very high level of dependency when it comes uh, to economic term terms. Uh, what else? Um, uh, um, that may maybe the, the, first, the first statement. Um, um, then we talked just give me the, ne the, next, the next question you had. First, Russia and dependency, and what next? I think it's enough. Okay, for the at this, okay. at this moment, I, I think it's enough to have that clear question. But um, this will be uh, your analysis, analysis now. Is um, the basis for the future for every future government, even a democratic one? Uh, and so I think uh, this is only the half of the answer for the country at all, uh, and not just economically. And uh, that's why I would like to ask you, if I see right, uh, that if you ask the people in Belarus, especially after the last August, uh, not, not the last, uh, August last year, um, that there will be a strong majority insisting in this political independence. Um, seeing this on the one hand, seeing the economic situation, um, what is your view about that tension and what gives hope for the opposition, for uh, Svetlana Tiranovskaya and the whole team, the leaders uh, of the opposition and the democratic movement. Um, starting there, not cut the link, and this was always the uh, message from them, not cut the link to Russia, but real to have its own way as independent self-determined democratic country. Uh, so if I understand your question correctly, it's about essentially the future for Belarus, even the democratic government in the, um, in the context of existing links and dependencies with Russia. 
So when it comes to the public opinion polls, I think the better person to refer to is uh, Andrei Vardamaski, who is in the room, who could possibly, maybe after a comment, who's conducting the public opinion polls, who has a better picture of this. But uh, if we look at the overall attitudes of Belarusians, and it's not a secret, it's been like discussed multiple times that the current protest is not and was not about geopolitical preferences and uh, Belarusians stand for their own sort of political uh, independence, independent foreign policy, and they do not seek alliances uh, such as, I don't know, like uh, turning towards knocking on the EU doorstep, asking for like membership perspective, that's not among the uh, priorities of Belarusians. And also, given this uh, multiple, uh, like many years of uh, Belarus sort of dependency on Russia and Belarus uh, integration into the Russian led Eurasian integration structures, there were some sort of preferences for Belarusians with like open borders and free movement of goods and labor force with Russia, when uh, there are these like natural connections, especially between the, let's say, borders uh, or those regions close to Russia with like Makilov and Gomel, where people, many um, work in, in Moscow and then send their remittances to Belarus and let alone the business ties. Uh, so I don't think that the Belarusians would want to shift away from Russia, uh, again, like overnight. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there were some sort of tendencies uh, among the opinion polls that uh, when Kremlin explicitly supported the, the uh, Lukashenko regime and uh, sort of um, tried to like legitimize this use of force by, by the regime, uh, it sort of also was reflected into the uh, negative attitudes uh, towards Kremlin among the Belarusians. Uh, then there is an interesting question of, let's say, uh, Russian uh, propaganda, which takes more sophisticated uh, forms, not only uh, like Solovyov kind of like uh, TV shows, but uh, interesting anonymous uh, Telegram channels, which tend to comment anonymously on, so to say, insider talks, what Putin d uh, decided in Kremlin regarding uh, Belarus. Uh, and that's, again, like that's an interesting vulnerability of Belarusian information space, uh, which we have today. And then uh, thinking about the uh, the prospects for the Belarusian uh, democratic forces, how they could find common language with Kremlin, I think they need to, well, first of all, at the moment, they're perceived with um, like criticism and they're mocked at, at least like in some public statements by like Biskov, for instance, or other people in Kremlin in the previous month. And they're not, like they were perceived in very diminishing terms and they were not perceived uh, as an independent force. They're usually portrayed as someone like a puppet of the West. Uh, and someone who obviously uh, appears as a danger to Kremlin's interest to keep Belarus in the orbit of uh, of uh, Russia in the in the long run. Um, and, and probably the most acceptable uh, figure for Moscow would be not someone like Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Uh, uh, more, more of, I think in my view, that would be someone more of like Babarika, who has sort of well-established or used to have well-established ties uh, among, let's say, like Moscow uh, circles. Uh, and also what I think is interesting about uh, a figure again like Babarika he was well perceived uh, and is perceived well perceived among Belarusian intellectuals and the artists and, and those um, uh, like people uh, who voters who generally uh, supported him. Uh, but it's knowing also that he has sort of good ties uh, with uh, within like some Russian um, counterparts and, and maybe like some business partners. Uh, so maybe like if we look for the future, if at some point. Um, Putin uh, decides to withdraw support from Lukashenko, and I think that's the most sort of crucial part if we think about like how Russia would make concessions over the Belarusian crisis. Again, like it's not a secret that their personal relations are, are far from being perfect. Uh, I mean, Putin and Lukashenko, and uh, Lukashenko uh, enjoys this sort of autocratic uh, friendship uh, because it. it at the moment, uh, Lukashenko stay in power serves the interests of Moscow in the region. But if there was another figure who would be more acceptable, uh, then uh, like Moscow would consider withdrawing its support uh, from Russia. Uh, and I think that the the policy or sort of the uh, the, the formulations that the Belarusian democratic forces have been using, they are. Um, 
viable and, and balanced in a sense not to agonize sort of the Russian bear directly, not to sort of shift this, um, uh, not to throw this um, uh, like confrontational rhetoric into the uh, Kremlin's face. Also because Bec not because we idealize like what Kremlin wants and will do uh, regarding Belarus, but with the understanding that we have open borders at the moment with Russia, we have very little leverage to sort of balance Russian aggression should it happen. And in this case, like dialogue and some constructive position is maybe the most optimal uh, solution uh, at this point. And I also know about, or at least I've heard in the previous month, about the attempts of, let's say, uh, the Warsaw or Vilnius-based democratic forces to reach out for some sort of negotiation or, let's say, like informal communications within different policy uh, circles in Kremlin. Um, and to establish maybe some sort of like expertise. Uh, again, I'm not saying that this strategy will work out, or maybe it will. Uh, there are also some, uh, but this sounds like um, like a good idea to pursue. And there are also interesting calls among the expert circles uh, to encourage maybe the EU and the US to include, um, let's say, Belarusian issue on the agenda when dealing with Russia. Uh, and of course, I don't have like any um, fast solution or recommendation here because that, that's way too complex and has many caveats, but that's another thought that is sort of um, uh, floating in the air and considered among Belarusian experts. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important point. Um, the Russia issue uh, cannot be solved um, from Belarus. It has to be solved, um, or not solved, but changed or uh, involved in the general issues with Russia by United States and U <coughs> European Union, and we are in Germany by Germany itself. Um, this will be a challenge for the next government um, in Germany, and it will be a challenge um, for European Union. Um, I think um, because we all know that and we have seen the scenarios that you discussed and developed it. Um, I will not repeat the last uh, panel about the scenarios, um, but I think we should concentrate uh, to the question because in this way we are sitting here, we are from European Union, there's an expert uh, and another expert about economy and financial situation. Uh, what should uh, Europe, what should we as Germany uh, do in this field? Uh, and there in the end of this paper, uh, we have seen there are a lot of recommendations and what you mentioned lastly uh, is uh, one of the recommendations that in foreign policy the issue of Belarus, Belarus um, has to be put on the agenda in talks uh, with Russia. Um, this I think is very, very important. Um, Sergei, I know you can't uh, t tell us about the negotiations, um, but you can tell us your position um, in this field. Um, what, in your view, should increasingly EU and Germany should do in this field? You mentioned you agree with that sanctions. It had to be enlarged. Uh, the pressure should be higher. Um, my question is, in which way you are thinking, sanctions is a lot of. It can be the question of economically, you mentioned some. Um, it's a question of the financial structures. SWIFT, Swift for instance, could be very strong. Um, another point is the question of personal sanctions. I think until now, there are not so many persons under sanction restrictions as 2010. Um, and uh, should this way enlarged, uh, this number uh, of people enlarged, we have that structure with Sweden and other countries who uh, gather that violations and crimes. Uh, to which level people uh, should be put 
on the list for sanctions uh, should be combined as European Union. This uh, crimes, uh, this involvement of crimes and putting people on this list. Let's ask in that question, what should we do in this field? I, <laughs> I don't believe uh, in personal sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Belarus. It, personal sanctions presuppose that the person targeted is interested in um, links to the European Union, uh, maybe has assets, is a, a little bit more kind of an uh, a, a international oligarch with assets uh, outside of the country. Probably there are some in Belarus, but it uh, it sounds more like a tool from a toolbox vis-a-vis -vis a Kremlin uh, and vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, uh, who do have a, a larger merger between state uh, uh, secret services and, and economic assets uh, outside of the country. I, I doubt that the, we can go far and get far with personal sanctions. That's why my uh, focus is to say I understand that we generally are very skeptical of sectorial sanctions or economic sanctions because we don't want to hurt people uh, and the country, but I'm not sure whether in this particular case we didn't get to the limits uh, of what is possible to do um, outside of this toolbox. Um, the SWIFT sanctions is, was in fact something that I proposed at the very, a very early stage as kind of to consider and to weigh the pros and cons. I know that the SWIFT sanctions generally are not very realistic and are very difficult to implement. So I'm, I'm realistic on that. But the sanctions on all, all other fronts, uh, economic fronts that, that, that I mentioned, uh, especially closing the loopholes and also talking about um, um, you know, not not financing the regime from outside uh, by international organizations would be a step forward. Uh, one more thing that I think is important, and I speak for myself, I, I wasn't even part, sure. in, in the coalition negotiations, I was part of the uh, group on interior policies and uh, uh, legal affairs. I, I was okay. not in the foreign policy group. Um, so I cannot say anything on behalf of the future government, uh, if, if it materializes. Um, but I am not sure that uh, making Belarus to, the, to, to part of the agenda vis-a-vis -vis Moscow is something that should be desirable from a geostrategic point of view. Because by doing so, you are giving Moscow um, another um, Trump, Trump, uh, Trump, how do you say it in English? You give them, give them another, another uh, leverage and another political capital uh, 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 regarding another country. I um, am not sure that this uh, kind of third way that the uh, Belarusian opposition has chosen, um, and that I'm not trying to uh, look at things geostrategically. Uh, uh, talk only about democracy. Uh, from the very beginning of, of the uprising, I told people with whom I had to do, with, with, I, with whom I talked, I think this was a strategic mistake. Um, you know, trying not to escalate, not to anger uh, Kremlin. Because the problem is, I cannot imagine uh, uh, Putin accepting anything democratic on its borders. Um, and then you will have to decide. You can, you can pick Babariko. What, what do you want to live in a, under kind of a semi-authoritarian Babariko regime, uh, which would be tolerated by Putin, oligarchic, whatever. Uh, but there will be no, uh, I cannot imagine, like my fantasy gets to its outer limits, uh, to imagine that the Kremlin can tolerate anything which you have in mind when you talk about democracy. And from that point of view, democracy and geostrategy are not two separate categories. For Putin, demo democratic threat is a geostrategic threat. Uh, and that's why I think that the opposition, both the opposition and the European Union from the very beginning, should have chosen the trajectory of a kind of the pro-European path of more active European involvement, sending someone, like what we demanded, sending an envoy right away uh, uh, to the Minsk during the first uh, phase of protests, and also encouraging the Belarusian opposition, this is my personal view, to, 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 to make a more clear statement vis-a-vis uh, -vis democracy and 
in the direction of European path uh, of development. I understand it's, it's a very, from economic uh, point of view, from the border point of view, from the societal point of view, this is something that is probably uh, quite, would have been quite risky, but at least it wouldn't have gotten us to the situation that we have now. Uh, because then Europe would have been an actor uh, um, and you would have chosen Europe to be an actor because you would have told Europe, we want to be part of you and, and your kind of world of democracy and values, and therefore you owe us support, just as Ukrainians do this. The, this is not, and I don't accuse anyone, this is a very difficult decision to make, and it's not up to me, but I think that strategically, this could have had the potential of a different development in a different, uh, uh, different direction. Can I just make uh, brief remarks? Uh, well, this, I understand this point of view, and maybe I personally would have sort of uh, advocated for this strategy, but uh, I think that in the light, like what is the guarantee that EU would be really interested in to acting more geopolitical and more decisive towards Belarus? It, because in the previous years, we've observed this interesting normalization dialogue uh, with Lukashenko, and also it's a big question, uh, what are the, what is the sort of agreement, what are the interests of the EU member states towards Belarus, and in general, uh, like what are the ambitions or lack thereof regarding Eastern uh, neighborhood. And uh, I think that Belarusians, they sort of felt um, um, maybe not left uh, without the, like, I think that the perception was and is that like EU won't be as decisive on Belarus as they were on Ukraine. And also maybe I will bring this uh, example of like Ryanair accident uh, and, and notice that before the Ryanair accident, the European diplomats, at least like the ones I've talked to, they were much less interested into introducing, let's say, sectoral sanctions because they were saying like, oh no, that's way too dramatic. This would, might hurt like the interests of our like European companies and stuff like that. And then after the Ryanair accident happened, and it actually uh, sort of violated and targeted the interests of the EU citizens, and this encouraged EU to become more decisive. And otherwise, I think we would be just left with this like rhetoric of EU being deeply concerned about Belarus. I, I, I agree and I respect your perspective totally, but one, uh, one point was that the European Union did not see and was asked not to see the developments in Belarus as a European issue. And I've, you know, we were kept asked not to uh, make a fuzz out of it, uh, be careful about the, 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 the opposition who wanted us to stay back. And once you have started this trajectory and this path, you cannot get out of it. So I, it's not an accusation, it's just an explanation. I think there would have been a room for maneuver if there was a stronger push and encouragement of the EU uh, to see it as their own issue and not just after the Ryan incident. Mr. Kegelbein, <clears throat> uh, even last year, but until now, there was a challenge for the EU uh, to prepare a pocket for Belarus, economically, financially, uh, to support it for the after Lukashenko time. Um, what can you see is done in this field? What would your be demand be for EU to do it uh, as good and as fast as possible. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, of course, it's it's a bit uh, difficult indeed to answer because it's uh, very future oriented. But uh, yes. what what we um, where we we've been engaged together with Conrad Adolf on our foundation by by the way and before. Uh, uh, um, in 2019 and 18 and, and before, we we tried indeed to to foster this um, uh, the for the forces in in the administration and in, in private business associations to really <coughs> structure themselves, to get used to vo voice or to to structure their positions, to voice these positions and to start a certain dialogue with with the administration, with ministries and so on and so forth. And I was in Minsk personally in 2018 and 19 and took part in some of these uh, exchanges. And if you wouldn't, if, if you didn't know that you are in Minsk, you would say okay, you are in a normal, normal democratic country where people really exchanging some emotional opinions and people from the private business weren't shy to address topics really clear towards uh, the public officials. 
So that is very interesting, a very interesting situation and and uh, an experience I made that there is, there was at least uh, until until end of 2019, really um, a readiness by the people to start this type of discussions and negotiation between private sector and public sector, and this is a thing I guess. Uh, which one could focus on to support private business companies. So that is what, what we are doing in the previous two years as well. So we're keeping on our formats with the IT industry. So saying, okay, working on with private businesses, especially from the IT sector, is still worth to do. Um, and this would be, I guess, a very important topic uh, to focus on this on this um, entrepreneurial issues, on, on uh, gathering interests, on forming associations, and uh, really getting some some um, some exercise how to formulate and voice your position. And this is what we supported together with uh, Adenauer Foundation in, in a very small scale, but we did it. And this would be one one issue uh, from my point of view we should really focus on. This is just building capacity from a business point of view, it's not, not nothing with civil society and NGOs, but this is indeed where some overlapping uh, interests, I guess, could be. And so you are satisfied what we are doing and what the European not, Union doing. It was not an assessment. Like, on, nothing, on, on, nothing more is necessary. Or. It was not, <laughs> not, not a statement on being, on being satisfied. Yeah. I just want to say that yeah. my experience is that there is mm -hmm. really, or people in Belarus are, are ready If, if you come with such kind of idea and, and make such offers, they are ready to, to grab it. So, and this is just, there is a potential. Uh, so the question is, what, what can we do right now? In a, in a, in a country where you have a, a the situation as you have it, uh, where is your, really your influence from outside? Uh, um, not only saying, okay, we are prepared with a certain amount of money, with some ideas, but where is your concrete outreach Could you organize in Minsk as a European Union, as Adenauer Foundation, some meetings, capacity building seminars? It's not possible at the moment. So that means for what we can do right now, or the European Union can do right now, is to, 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 be, to, be, to be prepared to making some offers for a time uh, after maybe uh, um, some reforms took place in the country. And um, what we always say, and this is what we um, issued directly after the elections, Uh, that we really need a an, an, an process of dialogue. I know that's dialogue right now, it's very uh, difficult since you need always more than one side for a dialogue. <coughs> But this is really um, um, a thing we we need and we, despite the situation that, that uh, one or two sides do not want to talk, but anyhow you have to follow this path, otherwise you're just sitting there and 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 uh, you are silent and no no uh, no no movement uh, you will see that means you have to work on on okay. on some channels to stay to get a, to get a contact and to to start the discussions even if it is hard i know okay i thought that it is, would be important uh, really on the eu level to prepare something not some something such channel all you are right what you said But in my view, it needs a clear, clear pocket to give a hope for a next government for an, after the change. It, there will be a change. We don't know when. But there will be a change. And you have to be prepared. And we have very often seen that EU, that we were not in past, we were not good enough prepared. And this is my point, I, I would think. But coming back to another field, uh, we have uh, that uh, issues of civil society. We have a lot of experiences uh, during the last one and a half, and much more, but especially during the last one and a half years. Um, and there was done a lot, but especially by the neighbor countries, especially by Poland, um, by Lithuania. Um, and I think uh, this was marvelous how fast Poland and Lithuania were ready to uh, invite people who are under danger, um, to give people space for exile. And not just for that kind of exile, which is often the case in our countries, to be frank, very often we uh, give people in exile to survive. 
but not to remain a political person, a political actor. And exactly that happened with Lithuania uh, and with Poland. Uh, I remember last year in September, um, I uh, met, when I met uh, Svetlana Tichanowskaya in Karpacz, the um, economic forum in Poland, and the day before the Polish Prime Minister uh, gave her the key of the house Belarus in Warsaw uh, to give, make clear there's a place you can work, you can be active, you can uh, bring people together. Um, and this kind of exile is necessary. And I would say it would be good to be active in that way in Germany and European Union at all. Um, Poland, for instance, uh, I think last week I got the uh, amount of, uh, not the amount, the number of humanitarian visa. Um, Poland gave uh, 12,000, it was, 12,000 um, humanitarian visa for people from, from uh, Belarus. I think we in Germany um, are not, not really 100, yes? Um, and so uh, there's really a gap in between. And the question is, in which way we in Germany, we in European Union, can support Poland and Hungary, and including Ukraine, many of them are living in Ukraine, uh, how can we do something to uh, help them in their fight and to organize them, to include their families. I would make the thesis that the future, the human resources for the future of Belarus are lying in this people. These are the active people. These are the uh, people with spirit, with uh, willingness, uh, with values. Uh, these are the people who are the future of Belarus, including the entrepreneurs. And uh, what you mentioned uh, in your um, panel, I think uh, this is a question. Are we good enough in this field? And would, what should be done more? Can you tell us more about that? Uh, so I will start with uh, referring to Poland and Lithuania and uh, point out that for past, I don't know, maybe a decade or more, those countries have been hosting Belarusian civil initiatives and uh, it was easier for several Belarusian NGOs to be registered in Poland or Lithuania uh, to pay the taxes there, to get the donor money there and then to de facto operate in Belarus. And thus, there was some sort of infrastructure for, uh, for those civil initiatives to once they were forced yeah. to flee the country. Uh, and also, again, like Poland and Lithuania are naturally more interested in, to the, in the Belarusian issues uh, than, let's say, like other, other uh, EU member states. Um, and uh, when it comes to Germany, I cannot um, sort of resist from bringing my personal example, which was that, um, let's say, so first of all, I'm very grateful to Lithuania and human rights uh, defenders who helped me out. And also it was the German Marshall Fund uh, where I was a, a Rethink CE fellow last year, which uh, organized my escape from Belarus because I was I didn't know if I would be sort of captured if I would be allowed freely to uh, to leave Belarus through the airport and I'm again like really grateful to my colleagues um, and uh, also again like even though over last year and a half I've been working in Vilnius mostly. I uh, received several offers from uh, German uh, NGOs and the German universities uh, as a sign of solidarity because there are multiple efforts of Belarusian diaspora in Germany and also several local initiatives coming from <coughs> university professors who would be interested in to inviting uh, Belarusian scholars and I was invited to give a series of lectures at, uh, uh, at uh, Frankfurt and Otter University. Uh, also I got an invite for 
some sort of like residency, a short-term residency in uh, Greifswald, where um, this was essentially like uh, the the attempt of local NGO there to find some resources to host several Belarusians, and there were other people from other countries, also like Belarusians, uh, sort of seeking this like short-term uh, support and residency. Uh, so. On the, on the on one hand, when like speaking to policymakers uh, in, in Germany or seeing this enormous wave of solidarity across different uh, levels and organizations, uh, I'm very grateful for what I see. Also, for how uh, again responsive those like the DGO and like other organizations are for. Um, finding opportunities to host the academics who had to escape the country, etc. But then, again, coming to my personal example, when I applied, when I had to turn to um, to the embassy uh, in, Lith uh, in Lithuania, to the German embassy, to request like a very short-term visa for just a short-term stay in Germany, I was declined. My my application was declined because I had a very weird uh, sort of papers on my hands. I did not have uh, at that time, like let's say, the residency permit in Lithuania, and it looked very suspicious to the officer who was um, processing my application. And then uh, sort of that was an interesting, uh, interesting uh, case how even the German initiatives to support the civil society actors in exile, it was essentially turned down by the sort of priorities of the Ministry of Interior, which Germany has. Uh, and uh, again, I was not so much in need because I will already safe and I was again looking for like a short-term exchange program whatever I didn't uh, really suffer from this but I also know multiple cases where people were applying for some sort of visa uh, in in Belarus uh, for, for to the German Embassy and and of course they were in much more dire situation they also did not happen to have this or that paperwork uh, and then like there were their applications were turned down so uh, again this is one uh, instance of like hard to stay maybe like um, away from like emotional assessments of this sort of uh, situation, but at the same time, I know like enormous sort of the solidarity and the, the position of the German MFA, which is very much like pro uh, Belarusian. Uh, and then there is another question of uh, how to support uh, those. Um, uh, efforts like whether t what platforms could be given to the Belarusian opposition forces, whether other countries, EU members, should seek ways to maybe establish their like representation offices. I would say like it's on your like it it depends on EU member states because like that would be your money in the end. Like if you can afford this, <laughs> like we would be like very grateful. But we also understand the sort of the the other side of it. Um, but. I think the most important thing is just to keep supporting the Belarusian civil society and democratic forces because that's important for again like how those um, how essentially like Belarusian forces sound uh, or are perceived on the international arena if they are backed up by EU support. Mr. Uh, may, may I, if I may, one make one remark, and that's good that you are in the working group on uh, interior and internal affairs. Uh, we at, at Ausschuss we have um, throughout the years several internship programs. Uh, since 2003 for uh, Southeastern Europe, then we were engaged four or five years with Ukraine. We had one with, uh, with um, Uzbekistan. And what we see is that um, not necessarily the, uh, the, Im the ideas or intention of the foreign ministry or, or ministry of uh, De economic uh, development and cooperation uh, overlays one-to-one -one with the interests of the Minister of Interior. And in the end, uh, the, the visa is issued by a, a person from the Minister, Ministry of Interior. And this is, I guess, a, uh, the, the, the gap you, 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 you felt personally, this is really a gap. Even in, in programs like we have, uh, financed and supported by state structures, it is always, always not that easy to get at least a half-year uh, visa for a person with a working contract with enough finance from private and public side, even then it's not that easy to get this visa. And in, in cases like yours, even more, more harder. And uh, maybe that's why more people went to Ukraine or, or Poland, um, or uh, we learned in our panel that the States and other countries like Georgia, for example, as well, is much more easy, much more easy than, than coming to Germany. But just one, one, one thing for, for your working group, uh, maybe to, to have this in mind. Sagi. The work of the working group is done. Uh, now this week, uh, all our, uh, everything that we negotiated is being negotiated by the, in the final round. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure that 
those issues would be probably uh, viewed differently by the new uh, uh, interior minister. This is my hope. I cannot promise anything, but this is my hope because in any case, we will not have the uh, uh, representatives of the CSU um, uh, who would be, you know, it just not feasible for this part. I'm sorry for this house, but, well, this house is CDU anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, Hans Seidel um, uh, is a different house. Anyway, um, I do share, though, um, the, the, the view that Germany should improve uh, a situation there with both humanitarian visas, emergency visas, um, uh, also with other ways beyond asylum seekers' um, uh, opportunities, because this is something, by the way, it's not just a Belarus, Belarusian problem, it's a, also a Russia problem, it's also a Turkey problem, which I also deal with um, in the parliament, that for many uh, people, uh, they do not want to go through the asylum procedure. They want to be here, they want to have an opportunity to go back uh, and to have uh, ties and just to work here. So this is this is this part, uh, a sort of an organizational asylum, as I, as we as I call it, an organizational shelter, uh, also should be explored how uh, to make it easier for whole organizations or uh, uh, companies to move um, as easy as possible uh, outside of the countries uh, if they are endangered. So uh, there is a lot of homework to be done, and of course projects like the Free University Project or whatever the new name is, um, uh, that where people are trying to, to, to create a platform here for uh, uh, people from the, the respective countries, uh, is something that I think this government or the new government should very much support. I think um, having the situation in Belarus in mind, uh, we all know that there is no short-term solution. Um, and it needs attention for that country. And if we wouldn't have the situation um, at the border between Poland and Belarus and the instrumentalization of uh, that migrants by Lukashenko, um, it is a question on which level uh, Belarus would be in the international attention today. Uh, and so I think we should consider, and in that recommendations is, is it repeated what we asked for last year in Germany to, um, to establish a special envoy for Belarus. In my view, it is really necessary. Um, and the same uh, should be done by the European Union. Um, I, that's why I would like to repeat it, because you have one who is continuously dealing with that. Uh, I know that in the foreign office, in different places, again and again, it's the case, but you have always in such meetings uh, or departments a lot of crisis in foreign policy. You have a lot of topics in your meetings. Um, and you need structures which continuously deal with that and bring people together. We need much more research about that. We need education. We need networking um, and money for networking. Sometimes it is not so much. There's a lot of money in the foreign office for Belarus, but it's uh, difficult to get it by the administrative uh, situation uh, and it needs a long time, very detailed uh, application formula uh, and long decision making uh, and all this is a problem and that's why I think let's start with uh, a long term perspective to develop long term strategies um, and even to uh, yeah we lent man this of English to dig a bretter to born. Uh, how to... Tackle, tackle okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this, I think, uh, should be done, uh, should be done in this field, and especially the question of um, civil society, which are the most important 
people, not that the other are not, who are in the country not so important, but there is much more hope. They have opportunities which the people in the country today very often not have. And we can give them the space. We have seen that the uh, diaspora, which until last year was not so political, it is during these months is so much politicized. This is a new chance again for the country. In this field, we have a chance to help the future of democracy in Poland. We cannot export democracy to Belarus, but we can support actors for that. And these are living in European Union, and we should be in solidarity with these countries who are more uh, in the neighborhood uh, than we, but we should share the burdens uh, in that field. My last point uh, is we cannot put it by side, is the situation at the border. Um, I would say, on the one hand, I appreciated Poland very much, what uh, Poland did for Belarus. Belarus. But I can follow the policy of Poland, um, how Poland deals with that question, putting transparency away, NGOs and media uh, refused to be, to observe it. Uh, that experience of pushbacks, uh, all of that is a disaster. And if you see the dignity of that people, it is violate, violated in a strong way. Uh, and I can't really get it in my head that both happens together in this way uh, the instrumentalizing of the refugees is doing by both of these. Even when Lukashenko is the reason and he instrumentalizing it, but it has to be solved. Uh, I would like to ask you, all three of you, if you can give your positions and messages uh, in this field shortly. So uh, shortly, do not be um, like do not uh, be lured by the promises of whatever Lukashenko tells you. And uh, if we talk about the migration crisis, I cannot resist from bringing up his quote, like Lukashenko's quote from 2009, which he delivered at some, let's say, like border. Uh, international border something conference where he was uh, first thanking the EU for giving the money to reinforce the cross-border infrastructure and then reassuring that e every euro allocated to Belarusian uh, side would be used to uh, sort of to reinforce like first like the um, the EU Belarus connections but also to reinforce common security and uh, what we observed in the past years um, Again, like all the efforts of uh, you uh, to deliver maybe some uh, technical assistance to avoid some sensitive issues during the time of normalization, they were sort of working only up to the point when uh, it came up uh, to the point of Lukashenko's personal survival. And then every like word and promise uh, he delivered, it was just swept away. Uh, and this just brings me about um, sort of the, the reminder of what his words are worth uh, when uh, some, let's say, EU policymakers might consider uh, establishing a dialogue and uh, actually like um, trusting uh, trusting his words that he won't uh, he, that he will deliver on his promises. Um, I mean, for, first of all, my. Uh, um, my attitude towards the current Polish government is not very good uh, for um, various issues and we do have uh, a rule of law problem uh, and we continue to have rule of law problem. Um, and part of, it, of this, uh, the problem that we're having here is um, distrust 
towards Polish government that it can do things in a rule of law way, in a in a democratic way, and that's why I think it's a it's a, a, a strategic mistake by the Polish government to disallow transparency and to to close the the the, the border to the for the NGO organizations and and journalists. I don't see why. Uh, uh, why they shouldn't? What what, are, what would they be risking? Uh, not much, but they would sh be able to show uh, and to unmask the propaganda of the regime of Lukashenko, uh, telling that there is a genocide basically on the border, which is not the case. The biggest problems are on the other side of the border. That's where people are sitting in the woods. That's where the guards are not letting them to get back to 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 Minsk, etc. I uh, want to emphasize that w n nobody, um, also not my party, ever talked about a Europe without borders. Um, of course, we need bo controlled borders around the European Union. And that's why you know, I do not belong to those who say you know, having fences at the border is already a violation of human rights. No, we need to have fences. Or for that matter, you know, whatever other constructions, but those fences have to have doors and gates where people who are in need can come in and say, we need a procedure, we need a process. And that's what the migration policy, where the migration policy of the European Union has always failed. This is not just Polish problem. This is a European problem, and that's why Lukashenko and Putin are using this, because we don't have a mechanism that would allow us to, for example, gather all the people in a situation like this on the territory of uh, the European Union, not in Ukraine, as <laughs> some propose, on the territory of European Union, process uh, uh, their applications at the first glance, redistribute them among uh, uh, states who are willing to do so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But having said this, I, I refuse to be a useful idiot for Lukashenko or Putin. Uh, I, I do think that it is important to see this in the context, precisely because of Polish role and Lithuanian role in uh, countering the uh, the totalitarians in Minsk. That's why they're also victims in this situation, and we owe them solidarity, even under those difficult uh, circumstances. We need to see this in context, in a larger context. This is also not these people, the poor people who are instrumentalized, but the the strategy behind that. This is also an attack on them to re to have a revenge. Uh, uh, for everything they've done for the Polish, uh, for the Belarusian opposition. Yeah, uh, so it's not a not a question for a or a core, a core question for business organization. This topic of uh, having the refugees in the in the in the borderlands, but anyhow, at least you should treat people like human beings. So I guess that is um, uh, what I can say as well. Anything else is a political question. I would like to uh, take up your your topic of of borders. So what we see right now is that uh, Poland and other states uh, um, are building fences or other uh, construct, uh, uh, constructions. So what we see from, and then there comes business perspective in, what you said, we need indeed gates and, and doors and not uh, starting to raise new walls or borders to the eastern uh, eastern neighbor, neighborhood of, of Europe. So, But in, in, then in the end, it's not only maybe about a, mi a migrant from Iraq, but at a certain point, it maybe affects a truck or what else, or some good. So that's why um, I just, we need structured processes and then another business issue come in for the German, for our economy as well. Structured processes of, migra of migration would be, would be helpful. So that's why I just want to make this, uh, this remarks, um, even when, when this migrant topic in the, in the woods are not business related in the first end, but in the end, some of it is. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for this, I think, uh, good discussion. Uh, so we open um, that discussion for some questions for the auditorium. Uh, is there one who have a question or a remark? Yes? and sorry for 
standing between the uh, dinner and uh, <laughs> and everyone. But uh, my name is Natalia Novakova. I'm from Open Society Foundations. So I wanted to go back a little bit to the very beginning of the question of independence and uh, and the threats to it, uh, which is speculated quite frequently. What Russia wants, what it doesn't want. I was wondering, like. I guess, I mean, I'm not such a deep expert as Katerina is, but uh, um, I'm like kind of not really believing in the idea of full occupation, but I find it quite likely that Russia will want to kind of um, um, broaden the economic grip of a Belarus. And I was wondering if, um, if EU could do something around it. Could it be an option for sanctions for such a purchases by Russia, would it go into kind of broader picture of further like developing this connection between EU policy towards both countries? Do you think it might be possible? And then the second question, I do agree strongly, Sergei, with you on the um, uh, kind of, um, uh, I don't know, the, the, the in ineffectivity of personal sanctions. And I do think that perhaps that's a time for kind of not popular but sectoral steps. And then how do we interact, uh, how we kind of, because the last fourth round showed that European business lobby is actually quite effective with preserving the loopholes. Uh, what can we do to counteract that? Is it the civil society push should be stronger? Is it like European politicians might be more annoyed in the context of uh, of the further Lukashenko's outrageous steps? How do you see this developing further? Thank you. Thank you. There's another question. Добрый. Lukashuk, European Radio. I've got a question to say, Gay. As a representative of the European Parliament and, uh, as I understood, a representative of the Green Party, you said that the time for dialogue has long passed. Sanctions which were mentioned, um, yeah, there are many experts here who, uh, as the politologue um, Kazakiewicz or the economist Lev Lvovsky said that there are no examples uh, that sanctions could lead to a regime change and that uh, thanks to sanctions a regime could fall and that we could uh, get democratic changes and still uh, if you say that uh, there shouldn't be a dialogue but sanctions um, and if uh, experts of the Green Party um, maybe they will be represented in the new Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Germany. Um, how do you see a policy in terms of Belarus? Uh, how can uh, this uh, position continue? How can you continue the pressure on, on Belarus? I understood uh, that if there will be more migrants, uh, Lukashenko will not stop them because they don't want to go to Belarus, as they said on BBC. So that this crisis could be repeated, couldn't it? Question: Who is there? There's no. That was the last question. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think it is clear. It won't be possible to answer all these both questions at all. But uh, it is not the ability of such kind of conference or a podium uh, panel that we can solve all of that. And that's why I give open questions to the sky and to uh, reconsideration uh, should be included. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, every of you uh, to put out one of these dimensions of these questions for your own short answer. Yeah, I'll refer to what Natalia mentioned about Russian, actually 
appetites towards Belarus. So from one hand, I think it's not in uh, Russia's interest to sort of uh, annex Belarus violently and in the broad daylight, but uh, Naturally, like Russia seeks to have more grip through like some indirect influences over Belarus and Belarusian economy, and uh, I think it's uh, an important observation that we don't know the actual cost of Russian support to the survival that ensured the survival of Lukashenko regime uh, during past uh, month of the crisis, uh, because it was like very much sort of clear that uh, Lukashenko, without Moscow's money and political support, uh, like his uh, state power and his uh, ability to consolidate the uh, his positions among the elites, among like Siloviki structures, it, it will be uh, very much uh, in question. Um, and uh, at the same time, when we talk about sanctions, um, I would maybe, uh, and, and maybe like sanctioning, or like the, the question like whether we need sanctions against Russia, um, I would point out to the Belarus Democracy Act and the possibility that it envisions to introduce the US sanctions against the individuals and companies who support essentially, who are involved into supporting the Lukashenko regime uh, and uh, ensuring his survival. So I think this, and the US sanctions are like really, if, if properly sort of implemented, they're, I think, a substantial threat to the uh, US uh, or to the uh, Russian, let's say, like oligarchs and, and Russian um, groups. I'm not saying that we need to introduce those sort of uh, on the broad scale right away. I think it could be an interesting point of maybe pressure or leverage in some sort of negotiations. And then I... I I, I'm just keep thinking about this again, like idea among the experts about uh, whether we need to put the like, EU on, um, like Belarus on the EU Russia or let's say US Russia negotiations. It's very questionable, has many risks uh, attached to it. But um, I think that maybe like there is a way for some sort of like dialogue and engagement with uh, with Russia over over uh, Belarusian. Uh, or like encouraging ways to so the Kremlin reduces its support to Lukashenko. Uh, again, many questions. Um, I'm not going into details how this could be done. We've mentioned this in, in the scenarios, but then multiple contradictions and, and interests, uh, etc. Uh, but I think that uh, again, like the U.S., the risk of implementing the the sort of sanctions that the U.S. Belarus Democracy Act. It's a good sort of leverage which you do not necessarily need to implement, but it's a good uh, sort of risk that could be used uh, when uh, dealing with uh, Russian counterparts. Uh, so I can't give you an assessment how, how the sanctions are working on, on the sanctions uh, big Belarusian state entities. What I, um, what, or what we had in the economic panel is that we see already some, some costs, some impact uh, in terms of that the uh, refinancing, especially for private business rises and the instability rises. So we see already an impact. And what, what we heard from our member companies is that uh, especially this topic of, uh, of financing um, um, really provides a um, certain uncertainty uh, in the business relations. So there is a certain impact of what we see. Maybe not, not, uh, not, not um, uh, really by the sectoral sanctions, but from the German side, from German companies, we really see that they are more and more modest. Uh, so my question, I don't know if this is, was the intention of the sanctions, but this is what I can share from, from communication with, with companies from Germany. Thank you. Seke. Uh, yes, very, so very, very briefly uh, to, uh, uh, I think, Mr. Uh, Lukashuk, as far as I remember. Um, um, basically, everything I said is, does not contradict to the green party line, so <laughs> all of the above uh, could be expected, could be expected uh, if uh, foreign policy is in, in a way uh, determined uh, by the party. It's not, a, it's not a decided, um, it's not yet decided whether the Greens would take foreign ministry, it's not clear uh, for now. Um, uh, I do agree that uh, sanctions uh, and their effectiveness uh, it's it's not very um, it's not a clear deal whether that they don't work because the situation with sanctions is that we don't know the hypothetical uh, behavior that would have been there uh, if the sanctions weren't there 
Uh, it's like with the Crimea. Some people say, well, the Crimea is still not back uh, in, in Ukraine. Well, but maybe other <laughs> regions would have been long uh, part of uh, occupied Ru uh, occupying Russia. Um, so uh, I do think that uh, we need dialogue. I think that there is a di that that even with countries like that and the systems like that, this is my own perception opinion. Um, we do need dialogue. The question is how and when such dialogue should take place. It should be definitely a dialogue with civil society. This is clear, and should it, and it could be definitely a dialogue on the technical levels. Uh, you can always have a dialogue with uh, another state, even if with a rogue state on a technical and not on a high political level. And I think it's important if we need some issues to clarify, this dialogue should continue. But, and uh, um, if it is about political dialogue, then on the, under, only under certain conditions and in the right context. I don't think that a political, high political dialogue in the context of blackmail, even if it's a phone call, is something that we should do because we know exactly, how, even for humanitarian reasons, I understand kind of the humanitarian motives uh, uh, for that, but uh, even in, in a situation like that, we should avoid any uh, signal that we are giving in uh, to this regime uh, um, in the situation of this very anti-humanitarian blackmail. Um, but otherwise, technical and civil society uh, dialogue and uh, contacts should of course, continue. Well, thank you very much for all you three. Um, we had to come to an end. Um, 30 years of independence, that was the issue we discussed. Um, we have to add to that, not the question only of independence, but also um, of solidarity and freedom. Uh, and self-determined, that's the challenge. Uh, and we know that democracy cannot be exported uh, and the domestic issues cannot be directly changed by us. But what we can do is to give attention to that country, to have it in mind, to have it as a basis for our acting and to give and to improve our solidarity with this country and with the people of this country and especially that who are suffering now. Thank you very much. All the best for you. This panel is coming to an end.